Hi, I'm Phil Copeman, and I'll be talking about autonomous vehicle technologies, Newtonian mechanics versus the real world. Let me start with an overview. There are limits of the ability of an autonomous vehicle to exert trajectory control, and those limits have to do with vehicle capability, both for your own and other vehicles, and also the environmental conditions. Now, hopefully you don't have to operate in a chaotic snowstorm scene such as the one I'm showing, but there are limits to your ODD and they might be broader than you might think. Related to that is uncertainty, both about the vehicle conditions and about the environment. And finally, I'll talk about micro ODDs, which are a way to organize the various constraints and pieces of the ODD to hopefully make the problem a little bit simpler to deal with. Let me start with an example of safe following distance. Here we have two vehicles. There's a green lead vehicle and a blue trailing vehicle, and probably we're mostly worried about the trailing vehicle. What if the green vehicle decides to do a panic stop? Well, if that happens, the blue vehicle in the back might be actually accelerating, and it will take a while for it to notice that the green vehicle is slowing down, and during that time, during the response time, it'll be accelerating. After that, the blue vehicle should brake as hard as possible to try not to hit the green vehicle. Now it's important to realize that these two vehicles might have different braking capability and the blue vehicle might be approaching very quickly when the green vehicle decides to do a panic stop. In this example, we're going to consider the result safe if the blue vehicle doesn't hit the green vehicle. In other words, if there's a positive gap between them. Now it turns out the basic principles behind this situation have been around for a really long time, F equals MA. Now it's important to realize throughout all this, no matter how you package it, no matter how you look at it, at some point, F equals MA is not just a good idea, it's Newton's law. Now while this seems simple, and in physics class maybe the problems weren't that bad, when you hit the real world, the issue is that A is kind of tricky. The acceleration, in this case the braking force of the deceleration, but we'll call it A, the acceleration is limited by the ability of the tires to grab hold of the road surface. All your stopping power goes through the tire contact patch onto the road surface. So you really need to understand what's the maximum force that can be applied there. The equation for that is that the force of friction, in other words, the maximum deceleration force exerted on the vehicle, is the coefficient of friction, which involves both the road surface and the tires, times the normal force, meaning the force with which the vehicle presses against the road surface perpendicular to the road. On a flat surface, that's just the weight, but things can get more complicated. Now for this example, your ability to brake depends on both the ability of the vehicle to exert force against the roadway and also whether the driver actually presses the brakes as hard as possible. Now I mentioned that when the road is flat that the normal force equals the weight of the vehicle. However, when you are on a hill you have two problems. The first problem is that you're losing some of the weight because the road is tilted and the normal force is actually reduced, impairing your ability to brake. But worse than that, where did the rest of the weight go? Well, the rest of the weight is actually pulling you down the hill. So not only can you stop less effectively, you're actually getting pulled down the hill, so it's harder to stop even if you had the friction available, which you don't. Curves have similar issues. Some of that friction force of the tire contact patch is being used to pull you around the curve. That frictional force, having partially been spent on the centripetal force, leaves you less ability to brake. So it's gonna be harder to brake if you happen to be in a turn, also, banking, otherwise known as super elevation, can help if the curve is banked in, but if the curve is banked out, it actually even further reduces the ability of the vehicle to stop because the curve is, is lifting the vehicle off the road surface as it goes around. Well, now that we've talked about road geometry, you also have to consider road surfaces. On dry concrete, mu might be 0.75 for an average set of tires on dry pavement. But when you get ice, it might be 0.1. That's more than a seven times difference in the coefficient of friction available to stop your car. So it's really going to matter if the road surface is able to stop you or whether it's really slippery and you're going to have trouble stopping. Beyond the road surface, you also have to look at own vehicle capability. You have a tire capability. Some tires are sticky and give great traction, but wear out pretty quickly. And other tires are less sticky, they last longer, but they may not provide the stopping force. Especially sticky tires can even have a mu greater than one because they're basically trying to glue themselves to the road. So you might have a lead vehicle with really sticky tires making it stop quickly, and you might have a trailing vehicle with non-sticky tires, and it's going to be harder for that one to brake effectively. 
You also have to look at the capabilities of the brake pads. If you have worn out brakes that aren't working very well, that's also going to reduce your ability to stop the trailing vehicle. You also have to consider equipment condition. Vehicles leaving the factory will have a certain capability to brake some more than others, but after that, tire condition, brake condition, vehicle suspension, weight distribution, all these things will conspire to increase or decrease the braking ability. Consider if you just went through a puddle and the puddle splashed your brake pads and caused a temporary loss of braking ability. So those are things that are both long and short term and might be difficult to predict on any particular vehicle. For the lead vehicle, whether that vehicle can actually stop quickly or not will depend not only on its condition of equipment, but also on the driver. Some drivers have really strong legs and can push the brakes really hard, others not so much. Finally, things like aerodynamics, suspension, debris on the road are all going to matter. If you hit a patch of gravel, it's going to be hard to stop quickly, just as an example. Now, we just discussed that all sorts of factors of both the environment and the vehicle will affect the ability of the trailing vehicle to brake as well as the lead vehicle. But beyond that, you have a problem of uncertainty. When you're working physics problems, you typically assume you know the value of all the variables. You know all the values. But there's a problem with that. In the real world, you don't actually know all the values precisely, and somebody might just be guessing it. You could have brake wear and failure. You could have loss of brake assist. You could have higher tire pressures or bald tires that impair your stopping ability. You could have brakes hot from recent use, re wet from recent puddle, as we discussed. And the thing is, you don't actually know that these are all true until you start braking. Now, that's true for human drivers as well as autonomous vehicles. Sometimes when you press the brake pedal, it turns out the brakes aren't really there for you, and you're going to have to account for that somehow if you want to prove you're always following at a safe distance. The lead vehicle might have exceptionally strong braking. It might have actually upgraded the brakes. There might be non-factory brakes, non-factory tires that brake much more effectively than you would have expected for that type of vehicle if you can even figure out which type of vehicle it is that you're following. There's also uncertainty about the environment. The road surface of your vehicle might be different than the road surface of the other vehicle. For that matter, the road surface of your vehicle might change dramatically from minute to minute. Let's give an example. Let's say in the picture of the snow below, you have the lead vehicle that has its wheels in the place where it's being cleaned off and the pavement is wet, but not frozen. If your vehicle is a few inches to one side, what you're going to find out is that you're on ice and you can stop a lot less effectively than the vehicle in front. You're on the same roadway. You're traversing the exact same ground, but a few inches to one side might make a factor of two or factor of three difference in the coefficient of friction. So you cannot necessarily make the assumption that coefficient of friction is the same for both vehicles, even on the same piece of roadway. Additionally, the coefficient of friction might change really dramatically. So in the picture on the bottom right, you see the classic bridge freezes before road surface. And in this case, coming off the bridge, the trailing vehicle will still be on ice while the lead vehicle will be on clean, dry pavement. And if the lead vehicle jams on its brakes, the trailing vehicle might just slide right into it. Okay, that all sounded complicated, and to a degree it is. Now, clearly there are going to be some parameters that matter a lot and some that matter a little, but they might matter a lot or a little in somewhat different circumstances. So you need a way to organize all this stuff. If you have a single huge operational design domain, then what you're going to end up doing, if you have the same rules for everywhere, is you're going to pretend that you're on ice the whole time. And people are not going to want to use your product on a dry, clean day where you could follow less than a kilometer behind the car in front of you. So you have this entire ODD, but you want to do better than just taking a worst case across the entire thing, which you would have to do if you wanted to actually prove you had a good following distance. So intuitively, what people tend to do is they tend to divide it up into pieces and then work each problem separately. But I want to propose a slightly different way of looking at it. So we have the entire ODD, and I would assert that you probably can be safe with worst case assumptions across everything. Now that means you're going to be just crawling. It means the performance is not going to be great. But you know, think about it, people in a really intense blizzard end up doing that anyway. So it might be okay to crawl very slowly as long as you don't do it very often. So it's a fallback plan. Sounds like a minimalist maneuver, except we're not pulling to the side of the road. We're just operating extremely cautiously. Now that may not sound great, but the idea here is to not optimize everything, just optimize the things that matter. 
So for example, if your ODD, most of the time you spend on a warm, dry, flat highway, and the rest of it is very infrequent, you really only need to optimize that. Well, if you segment the ODD into that, I call it a micro ODD, what you can do is you can prove safety as long as you're in that area, and you can be much more performant. Well, instead of having to prove optimality and safety for everything, you can focus your attention on getting this 80% right, and the other 20%, well, you don't do so well. Well, what do you do next? Well, there's some other areas you say, there's some big chunks we want to optimize and be pretty good at. Now, this is a little different than expanding your ODD because you can actually operate everywhere. And what you're doing is you're hill climbing to improve performance. After a while, you find out there's actually some even more special cases where you can do even better. Now, what you're doing here is maximizing your engineering effort on the things that matter, the things that provide value, because the edge cases are covered by a safety net of going really, really slowly. The micro ODD approach turns ODD growth on its head. Rather than having a very narrow ODD and having to do a safety shutdown when you exit it, in fact, you have a very broad ODD that just has bad performance, and you look at the economics of where it's worth your time to improve performance. But the nice part is, even if you only cover 99% of the ODD, you know the other 1% is covered, it just has poor permissiveness. So this permits a hill climb based on economics instead of worrying about hitting a cliff that causes something unsafe when you deviate slightly from what you're used to seeing. What I expect over time, if you use this, is you'll have finer and finer grain optimizations just for the things that matter. Now there is a catch here. There is no free lunch, of course. You still have to deal with safety when you're transitioning between micro ODDs, but you're gonna to have to do that no matter what ODD partitioning method you used. I put some references here. There's a paper that describes micro ODDs in more detail. There's a paper on ODD parameters listing all the kinds of things you should think about. And chapter eight of UL 4600 talks about ODDs and trajectory control safety arguments. In conclusion, proofs are great, but you have to rely on some assumptions. In particular, you have to rely on assumptions about the environment and behaviors and that you know what's actually going on, resulting in permissiveness versus safety trade-offs. If you have proofs of safety, you can say, I'm proven safe under some assumptions. But the thing to look out for is to make sure you're not sweeping too much uncertainty about your own system, about others, actors, and about the environment into those assumptions. At some point, those assumptions are going to be an issue. Or, as I like to say, you might forget about the edge cases, but they won't forget about you.